So before I begin, I want maybe uh, with a quick show of hand, who here has uh, had any experience with hardware tracing? Okay, so pretty much a good portion of the, the room. And who has had any experience with software tracing such as F-Trace or LTTNG? Okay, so pretty much uh, all the room also, so that's good. So the title of the presentation is Bridging the Gap Between Hardware and Software Tracing. My name is Christian Baber. So when I was preparing this talk, I, I stumbled upon this, this picture. Um, it's an ARM processor. It's the Cortex-A9. And I, what I found quite interesting is that uh, you have the, all the logical blocks, the core, the floating point unit, the neon SIMD, uh, the data cache, the con snoop control unit, and all that. And you have the PTM, which is the program trace macro cell. One of the things I found really interesting is that this debug and tracing uh, block is, I, I would say, like half of the Neon SIMD. And uh, currently in open source software, we're not really using that much the PTM in Linux, for example. So that's what uh, I thought was interesting. So like I said, I work at Efficios. We're a consulting company and a maintainership behind the LTTNG project. I have a background in embedded systems and I'll also contribute to the LTTNG projects. And I'll also do a, a open source stuff in my own free time. So the content of this talk is, will be what is hardware tracing exactly and why should we care about it? Why is it useful for software developers to use uh, hardware tracing? in software. Also, I'll do a quick presentation on the ARM core site and ETM uh, hardware infrastructure, and also the Freescale Core IQ and Nexus tracing. And finally, we'll do a bit of an overview of the LTTNG project and what we plan to do and what we'll do on, with hardware tracing. So what, what is hardware tracing exactly? So we know that it's, uh, we have blocks in the microprocessor or in hardware components that are used to trace instructions and data movement of a processing device. So I, I say hardware components because we could have uh, a, a, a processing device because we could pro um, trace a processor, but also data accelerators, uh, system bus, and all that kind of stuff. What is really important is that um, Hardware tracing permits the use of real-time observation of a system, for example, with an external data port with sufficient bandwidth. And one of the key aspects of hardware tracing is that it uh, has uh, low intrusiveness. So I want to distinguish two types of hardware tracing. Uh, I think most of you have used what we call the external trace with um, Basically, you have your processing device and the instructions and the system bus goes to a tracing device. And the tracing data is outputted to a trace port. And normally, the, what you need with that, you need special hardware to use that. And it, uh, most of the time, it's proprietary software to decode, to use the, the output of the, the hardware trace. So what is, what is great with that is that you can accommodate high data bandwidth but, and have minimal impact on the system. But the cons is that a trace port is not always available, let's say in mobile devices, or so you can really plug in a trace port. And you need, most of the time you need custom hardware, which are, is really expensive. What I really want to focus on on this call is the self-hosted trace. So, Basically, you have your same system, the instruction bus, and the system go bus goes in the tracing device. But the trace output is either saved in an internal trace buffer or in shared system memory. So what is nice with that is that the tracing is self-contained and the facilities can be used by the host operating system to uh, employ hardware tracing. And as there is no need for special hardware, as in the case of the trace board. Matacons is really, uh, on most processors, you have, you have really limited internal trace buffer space. But you can also configure it to use like shared memory and all that stuff. But it might impact system performance because you, you may be contending with the system bus, with the shared memory scenario. So here's a, a list of the, I would say, 
uh, vendors that are offering uh, hardware tracing support. So Harm has uh, a bunch of macro cells that SOC designers can use in their design with um, tracing in mind. So we'll talk about uh, a bit more about the ETM. And also PowerPC has uh, what it, the, the Freescale Core IQ um, as uh, the Nexus tracing facilities and we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. And they also introduced in the Power 8 infra, uh, architecture the branch history rolling buffer. So basically you have a small buffer with the branch history. And also Intel has re recently announced uh, last month that they would have uh, an architecture e extension which is the Intel processor tracing, which is basically processor um, flow tracing. And a big kudos to Intel, they released the, the decoder and all the documentation in the test and all that in open source. So we're still waiting for the hardware, but it's going to be pretty nice and we're, quite, uh, we're looking into that for the LTTNG project. And before that, they had the small, uh, like the last branch record, which has really limited space to save uh, branch tracing information. And there's a, a whole bunch uh, of other uh, embedded devices using, uh, providing hardware tracing facilities, such as, uh, such as MIPS. And uh, we saw, uh, yes, Wednesday, uh, the Callray guys had also uh, system trace um, facilities. So what is really the difference between hardware tracing and software tracing? In software tracing, most of the time you need to statically in instrument your code or dynamically do code patching, which sometimes, if, which sometimes can be intrusive and can be slow. And the, the level of granularity of the information you have is at the trace point level. So even on a Linux system, if you try to trace the whole, uh, let's say, block IO layer, you will have a lot of data. But in hardware tracing, uh, the tracing is done on hardware and the instrumentation is not required. So that means that you can uh, run programs that are not instrumented and get information about their behavior and performance characteristic. But you get also an instruction level granularity, so you get a lot of, of data. So you need to, sometimes you need to filter it because there's just too much data. So why, why should we care as uh, software developers and why our, tra our tracing could be useful? For example, we have the use case of profiling. Uh, with hardware tracing, we could get very fine profiling data versus the uh, statistic profiler approach, which, uh, for example, you have a case uh, nine, ten, uh, nine, nine times out of ten, you call it function and it's taking that much cycles and the 10, 10 times it takes a really large amount, it will, it will get lost in the, the statistical average. But with profiling um, on hardware, you will get really fine grain information about, oh, I spent that much cycle. So that's what we can do with uh, hardware um, profiling. You can also do performance measurement. And also cut coverage is really interesting because you have all the branch data instruction uh, all the branch data instruction. Normally, code coverage works by uh, instrumenting the binary to have all the branching info, but you already have that with hardware tracing, so we could have really fast code coverage. Also, uh, we could think about uh, monitoring use cases. So what, is, what are the statistics currently on the application that I'm running? How much interrupt I'm, I'm running in? How much uh, branches uh, I'm running in? Basically, some of the it's recoup a bit with the performance monitoring unit, but we could do monitoring with hardware tracing. One of the things that is also really nice is that we can take snapshot on crashes or anomaly. Some, um, some kernel developers, uh, what are doing, uh, I think it was, it was ARM, they investigated kernel crashes and when the system rebooted, the buffers were still in place so they could get the information about the crash. Because, um, and that works, uh, the trace buffers is overwriting the data until an anomaly is detected and then you, you simply read the buffer. We could also um, trigger a trace via uh, an event. Let's say I want this, uh, this interrupt or uh, I want to trigger a trace after an interrupt or whatever other condition or filter condition. This is possible also with most of hardware tracing facilities. 
And one of the things I'm really excited about is really hardware assisted tracing, software tracing. So instead of using uh, basically the ring buffer in software tracing solutions, you used, you leverage the hardware facilities and simply pipe your data from the software side to the hardware. So you don't get the overhead of the ring buffer uh, on the software side. So I'll do a, a quick overview of the, what is ARM CoreSight and the embedded trace macro cell. So CoreSight is really a collection of hardware components at, and the goal is to trace and debug a whole SOC. And it's really an open architecture. Some manufacturers are providing CoreSight compatible IPs. Uh, in CoreSight, you have trace sources. Trace sources can be processing elements such as CPUs, DSPs, but also buses and uh, system trace, which is generated from software. So the embedded trace macro cell, uh, what it does is that it monitors the core internal bus, with, uh, which provides you in instructions and data trace. You can set up quite complex hardware filters and triggers. So you can say, I want to filter these event out and trigger that trace on that particular ETM. It also does a, a bit of a trace stream compression. So you don't need to um, output event, uh, tracing events for every instruction. You output, uh, let's say, only for the branches because you know the instruction before that will be executed. And the tracing data can be saved in uh, an uh, internal buffer, which is called the ETB, or a shared system memory. We have a, an overview here of, a, well, I would say, a, a good example of a core side. What co can core side do? So you have uh, multiple uh, ARM processors, and you have DSPs, each with their own embedded trace macro cell. And all that is funneled either through the trace board or a non-chip buffer or system, uh, shared system memory. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. And you can see also the, what I was talking about earlier. It's the external port interfaces that uh, most of you have already used. So what is the state of CoreSight in Linux? Right now, there's a, upstream, there's an ETM tracer implementation available. Uh, it seems to work only on specific hardware, so I, I think it was contributed back in 2009. And uh, there's not, I think there's not, uh, have been much more work on that. But uh, recently, well, recently, like last year, uh, some, some people, uh, Pratik Patel uh, posted um, a framework patch set for the core site debugging infrastructure. And it has not, uh, I would say uh, trigger much attention, but uh, it's, uh, I think it has been revived recently by some guys at Linero for, to support that core site uh, framework within the Linux kernel. So right now in the Linux kernel, using core site and ETM is uh, kind of painful. So also, even if you, you're able to uh, get the tracing data, you would need to decode it, so, and I don't think there's uh, an open source uh, trace decoder uh, rightly available. So uh, if, you're, if you want more information about that, there will be a buff by uh, Powell at uh, 4.30 today in Pentland, so go there, it will be, it will be nice. Now we'll talk more about the Freescale Core IQ and the Nexus tracing infrastructure. So, the Freescale Core IQ is a PowerPC based platform targeted for our performance uh, communication system. It supports multiple E500 MCs processors and it has uh, what they call the data plane uh, accelerator architecture, which is basically packet processing and uh, offloading into accelerators. Which something is nice with that is that you can have tracing events generated by that particular accelerator and funnel back to the, the software system. And they also support the Nexus debugging and tracing standard, which we'll go into more details. So the Nexus standard is a ISO standard that was created um, a while back for debugging embedded systems. 
and uh, it was really designed for a low pin count and a standard set of connector, either G JTAG or debug port debugging. And there's also um, your hardware device can have multiple level of Nexus compliance. So the basic level is only debugging support, such as running, stopping, uh, setting breakpoints, inspecting memory. So tracing is not supported at that level. At the level two, we have ownership and program trace. Ownership tracing is basically when the operating system schedule a task, it will write into a specific registers and this uh, will generate an ownership trace message. So you can have the, the ownership that is switched uh, in your program. And also the program trace is basically uh, the, the branch tracing, the program trace flow. At the level three, we have data write trace, which is basically you can monitor in a certain region of memory all the data writes and generate a message for each uh, data write that were accessed at that specific address. And finally, at level four, you have multiple uh, optional support for memory substitution and uh, the one which I find quite nice is trace triggering via watch point. So you put a watch point and then you can trigger a whole set of trace or basically, uh, yeah, so you can trigger uh, traces. So the, the, the Nexus output format is really a packet based output format. Uh, the, the standards define public messages that you must comply to, but vendors can define their own extensions such as uh, what I said about the DPAA, it's an extension of Freescale and they can output specific uh, Nexus message for that. Uh, so the messages are a fixed packet side per message and the last packets can be of variable length, so you can have variable length data and message can have an optional timestamp and this is uh, because the timestamps are always are 32 bits so it can, if you generate timestamps for each of your messages, you can add some overhead to your uh, tracing bandwidth. So it's, you can disable it if you want. So here's two examples of Nexus message. Uh, the first one is the ownership trace message, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, basically the operating system switched in the uh, task with the PID value of this one. And we see that we have a timestamp the second message is really interesting. We get a resourceful message. Basically what happened is that the timestamp counter overflowed and for pro software, pro um, software program to handle synchronization with timestamps, you need to be able to, to know when the, the timestamp counter overflowed. So when the timestamp counter overflow, it will either um, block all the messages in a queue or simply drop them depending on the policy that you have set it up. So what is the state of, the, of Nexus in Linux? Uh, there's a Nexus Core IQ debug kernel module that is available in Freescale uh, Yocto layer. Basically the, the, this module implements a debug FS with memory map access to each core Nexus control register. So getting the trace is as simple as scatting the trace buffer in, the, in a text file. This is on the software side. So this is a simple listing of the um, core IQ debug, debug FS. So we see that we have each CPUs and uh, let's say we have the DPAA controller and uh, the NPC and NXC, which are Nexus related controllers. And if we go into the the CPU zero, we see that we, uh, these registers are important to enable either uh, specific tracing mode for the Nexus or the DDIM is write only is for uh, writing data to, uh, to generate tracing messages. So the Nexus decoder availability, uh, we will release uh, as part of the LTTNG uh, Babel Trace project, a converter and decoder for Nexus tracing format. Uh, one of the thing that is uh, with that is that even though we have decoded traces, we still need to have a proper open source software to reconstruct the, the whole program flow 
from the generator, generated traces. Perhaps we could put that in an IDE or perhaps Perf would have the right infrastructure for that. So this is ongoing work. So now we'll talk about what we are doing with LTTNG and hardware tracing. So just a recap, what is LTTNG? We have multiple tracers, we have utilities and viewers. In the tracers, we have both a kernel tracer and a user space tracer. The kernel tracer is implemented as a kernel module and it supports uh, the Linux 2.6.38 to 3.11. And uh, the user space tracer is basically an in-process library that, uh, that can, it can be used to generate user space events. On the utility side, we have the LTTNG command line, which is basically the, whole, the, the program responsible to interact with the daemons to enable events in your programs, to enable specific kernel events, and all that. And the uh, session D is really responsible for tracing registry uh, and, yeah, and that. And uh, the consumer is responsible to consume data. And we also have a really a daemon which is responsible to stream uh, tracing data to another host. So like I mentioned, we have viewers. Uh, the Babel Trace viewers is really a common line interface text viewer and a trace converter. And this is why we will talk about, uh, about the Nexus conversion. We also have uh, the LTTNG top, which is like an end curse top like viewer. And you can see in real time what is happening with your tracing data and your processes. And finally, we have a plugin in Eclipse that can show custom views about uh, LTTNG traces. And it's highly extensible. And uh, eventually, it would be nice to support hardware tracing in that viewer. So our initial attempt to support hardware tracing is to be able to convert the Nexus format to the common trace format used by the LTTNG uh, tool suite. The goal of that is to be really able to use the existing infrastructure for tracing visualization and uh, command line viewing. So while doing that, some issues that we encountered, um, the Nexus traces are not self-contained. You need sideband information from the OS, such as uh, the processor frequencies, how much processor do you have. Um, also, the, the internal trace buffers is quite limited. We have like 32K on the, on the platform I worked on. We had 32K of uh, memory and it, filed, it filled up qu quite fast. But we could use the external uh, DDR memory to store tracing data instead. And uh, to be able to synchronize with uh, kernel traces and user space traces, the timestamps that are generated by the hardware need to be uh, well, synchronized with the, the other traces, which, is, uh, which are using um, a, the monotonic clock and the epoch time. So we need to do synchronization with that. And it can be quite tricky. So I'll do a, I'll do a quick demo of uh, the, the converter and uh, a crash handler that we have. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first first thing I will show you is the basically the, the data generated from the um, Nexus uh, tracing port. So basically, just exactly similar values. But if we use the converter, we then get the appropriate messages. So we have a bunch of data acquisition message, which is custom data that we piped into uh, some messages. So basically here, I had a simple counter count to 512, I think. So this is the Nexus data uh, decoded. Also, one of the thing I did is that uh, I hooked up a crash handler in um, uh, in the, the the crash handler uh, file in the in the Linux kernel, and while that is uh, what we can do with that is when a program core dump, we generate a snapshot of the user space buffers 
of the, the current application running. And also, I did uh, a snapshot of the hardware traces buffer. So we have here the core dump, we have the hardware traces, and we have the user space traces all in one. So what we can do now is be able to view both the hardware traces and the snapshot with the user space tracing uh, information. So basically I have the data acquisition message and then my user space events generated from the UST, uh, LTTNG UST. So, getting back. So this is a, a small demo of what we can do. Okay, so future work. Uh, we intend to work on the more, more on the ARM and embedded trace macro cell side. Uh, maybe do a decoder or converter to CTF like we did for the, the Nexus um, trace format. It would, be, uh, it would be nice to support that. Also, one of the other thing we're looking into is to be able to control the hardware tracing facilities with the existing LTTNG tools come in line. And also, uh, finally, custom views for hardware traces with the Eclipse plugin would be quite nice to be able to visualize and to do custom uh, views in Eclipse. So in conclusion, maybe uh, what I, I want to say is it, it's, you have uh, the hardware tracing facilities are already available and they are quite useful to debug some kinds of problems. We, we have worked to do initial support for self-hosted hardware tracing, um, such as with the Nexus converter. And it would be nice because manufacturers are all doing some kind of hardware tracing. Perhaps there would be a common abstraction that we, we could aim for for hardware tracing in the Linux kernel. So, I don't have any more slides. Any questions? Yeah. Would he be willing to open source that? Yeah, I think that's, oh, that's great. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. How did you gather that? How did you? Uh, that, okay. Okay. So we have a. The question is, how did I gather the snapshot? Uh, on the, the machine. So the core dump handler from the kernel calls the snapshot command of LTTNG. So we get the UST buffers. And in that same script, what I did is I just dumped the hardware tracing that was available at that moment. So it's pure software? Yes. Any other questions? Yes? What about the resolution of the trace you may have in the solution? Are there some hardware limitations? About, well, it depends on, the, on, on how many events you have, you have enabled. Uh, some solutions will simply drop events when the ring buffer is full. And it depends on the configuration. For the Nexus, you can either block for a couple of cycles and then it will drop the event. Or you can simply drop it when the, the buffer is full. So it really depends on your configuration. So here's the question about the timestamp resolution or about how to pull? About the both things you said. All right, no other question? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes? Is there a reason you work with LTTNG instead of ARM? 
well, <laughs> I'm actually paid to work on LTTNG, so that's why I'm working on LTTNG. But it's a nice project, and we, I think it's a, they fill both different uh, use cases. All right, there's no other questions. Yes? On the, you, you ask, what is the status of the core site on the OMAP, TI OMAP? They were using OMA3 for their phones at this time, so you might be right. And uh, to answer the, uh, one of your bullet points on your slides, there is, with the ETM.C, there is a decoder, open source decoder of the uh, ETM format. Okay, and uh, what version is, uh, what ETM version is it decoding? The, that's the one that's together with the patch, so it's uh, ETM v3. Okay, so. And it's, it's uh, the link to it, it lives somewhere in GitHub. Yeah, yeah, it's a... Uh, the uh, COVID message. Yeah. <laughs> Most of these places. All right. Any other questions, comments? I guess not. All right, thank you.